I think we're going to start. Hannah, if you can, we're good to go. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Yen Yao. I'm the Director of Training Programs for the Grierson Trust. Delighted that uh, we've got such a great turnout for the session this evening. Um, uh, just before we launch into it, going to do some um, housekeeping rules. Um, can you please um, turn your video off? Um, so we can keep the connection stable and also mute yourself. As we're going along, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. There will be plenty of time to answer them at the end. And if we do run out of time, because we will be finishing promptly at um, in an hour's time, uh, what we will do is pick up on those and um, add them to the website so that um, the questions are um, responded to. But if you have anything else um, that we that you want to ask and we haven't been able to in the session, please do not hesitate to contact us by email. We're here to help and we want to be able to make sure that everybody gets the information and the clarity that they need. Um, we're also, just before we're going to formally start um, um, the, the session, is use something called Menti, uh, just to get a snapshot of who's joining us and who's interested in the training scheme. It's anonymous, it's very easy to use, and um, it's um, you, um, Join us via your desktop, your mobile phone, your um, whatever device that you're using. And um, there's a series of questions that um, we're going to ask at the beginning. And then at the end, we want to be returning to it as well, just to just have benchmark um, where we're at um, with, the, with the group who've joined us this evening. Um, as I say, the session is being recorded. So um, if you know anybody um, who has been unable to join us today and would like to um, still find out about it, please do let them know. And obviously for yourselves, if you want to review, um, it will be available on our website in a couple of days and closed captions uh, for those of you who need it as well. So those are the housekeeping rules. Um, as I said, uh, my name is Yen. Um, I'm director of the training programs for the Grayson Trust. And that means that I'm responsible for this. Now we now have four different training programs. Um, one which is called Doc Lab Core, which is also currently live uh, for applicants, and that's for new entrants who are 18 to 25 year olds who want to come into the industry who may or may not know what they want to do. We have two other schemes supported by Netflix, one for un, um, unscripted editors this year, which will be um, we're delivering the training at the end of this month, and the other one is for production management, and then we're um, it's Delighted um, that we have this new relationship and partnership working with Amazon. Um, we've got Donna Tabara and also Fozia Khan here today who are representing Amazon, who are going to be talking about why they're working with us to deliver this training program. Um, and the track record that we have, which has been developed over um, near, over 10 years now, means that we have, a, we have a very strong sense of what we need to do to support people facing different barriers to come into the industry who are underrepresented. And my job as the director of training programs with um, Tanya, who's our training coordinator, um, Hannah Brown, who's our marketing manager, and Sylvia Bernaz, who's our managing director, but unfortunately not able to join us this evening, is to really um, supercharge and support those people who, as I say, facing different barriers coming into the industry in whichever form that may be. Um, so that's myself, um, what we want to be doing. Um, the other thing to mention, um, the Grierson Trust is also known for the British Documentary Awards. Um, some of you in the room may have actually worked on some of those programmes that have been nominated or even won awards. Um, and that takes place every year in November and for the successful eight applicants um, selected for the scheme. They, with the other trainees on our other three programmes, will be invited to the Grierson Awards this year in November. Brilliant opportunity to network with industry. We have uh, probably about 700 people and um, a spotlight is shone on those people who've been selected for our training scheme. So you get to get a chance to meet people that you would otherwise not be able to meet. So um, that in a nutshell is what the Grierson Trust is about. Um, what we want to do today is really shine a light on, on this scheme. Um, asking Amazon um, questions about um, sharing with us and yourselves why they feel that this is an important area to be investing and looking at the skills gap. Um, overview, um, talking about how we will work with you as well if you're selected for the scheme and um, basically to just take questions um, from you. Please bear in mind this is a pilot, we've not run this before and, and you know some of the questions that you may be asking us and we might not have the immediate answer but we've got you know, people who are involved in the training here today, and uh, we may have to go away and come back to you, but please do ask all those different questions that you may have. Um, so before I go any further, I'd like just to launch the mentee so we get the sense of who's in the room. So what I will do, so if you can, on your browser or on your um, device of choice, can you go to mentee.com? And then um, what you will see, oops, not that, 
Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. So the first question really is just to find out who who is who is um, who is applying or thinking about applying to our scheme. So if you go to menti.com and then type in that code at the top of the screen, if you can see it, can you let us know what are you doing at the moment? Oh, can you see my screen? No, we can't. Ah, oh, OK. Um, sorry, I don't know why that is. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tanya. And uh, just to say on the next slide, if none of the options that I've given you fit your current situation, you'll get a chance to do that. So don't uh, uh, feel that you have to shoehorn yourself into one of these areas if they're, if they're not applicable. So I can see... Um, We've got 100 people in the room, um, about um, just under half of you have now um, filled in that question for us. So we'll wait until we get up to about 70 or 80, and then we'll move on to the next question. Okay, I'll just leave it actually, we'll move ahead. That's great, nicely moving up. The next question, if that um, doesn't apply to you, what is your, oh, um, oh, sorry, moving on. Yes, what's your what's your current job title? I think my slide board has um, gone out of sync. That's great. I'm just going to move on to the next one. So, sorry, my, my slides were out of order. So um, where we had the pie chart and asking you what your current situation was, if none of those uh, uh, drop down options were applicable to you, this is a chance for you just to uh, write up what your, what your situation, non-applicable, that's fine. Um, Where are you based? I mean, just uh, the scheme is a national scheme. Uh, with any of our schemes, we are always seeking a, a broad geographical spread of people that we select. So where are you guys based? That was great, I've got someone from Northern Ireland. Excellent, I'll move on to the next question. So this is really one about um, where are you at, at the moment? You're all here because you want to follow the ambition to be uh, archive producers, but what, what, what do you believe are your barriers? What is stopping you from uh, meeting your career, career ambitions in this area?
Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. We really appreciate you uh, being candid and sharing sharing this with us. Um, we'll be using this and referring to this um, later on as well. But um, in the meantime, I think that's given us a really good indication of who's in the room. Thank you. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do now is invite our panellists to introduce themselves, because um, that's whom you want to be hearing from today. So we're going to go in the order of Fozia, Donna, and then Sam. So Fozia, do you want to kick off, please, for us? Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, very, very excited to be kicking this off. Um, so I'm Fozia Khan, and I am the head of Unscripted at Amazon Originals UK. Great. Donna? Hi everyone, thanks for joining us and thanks Yen. I'm Donna Tabra and I'm Lead Training and Development uh, Consultant at Amazon, uh, looking after all training and development initiatives as part of Prime Video Pathway. Work very closely with Fozia and Anna, who um, is also on this call, will be leading on this project as well. And just to say, Don Donna, the fantastic Donna, is also a Grierson and trustee, so we're very lucky to have her on board. Thank you. And last but not least, we have our trainer, Sam. Hi everyone, um, I'm Sam Dwyer, I'm an archive producer, um, I have my own company called Fourth Draw and um, we, I work with a group of other archive producers and we work on um, a huge variety of work uh, in terms of archives, so we do documentaries, dramas, commercials, pop videos, podcasts, live events, um, but obviously for this course or all my training will be focused on archive specifically with uh in relation to documentary work that's great thanks sam um given given the subject matter i thought it'd be just quite nice just to have a snapshot of what uh what our speakers have watched recently so fozia what 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 doc have you been watching that's big on archive and why did it stand out for you um i watched the john galliano doc quite recently directed by Kevin McDonald, which Sam worked on as well. Um, and it was really, really, really interesting. And um, I think I was particularly fascinated by it because it was the archives from my sort of teen years, you know, it was sort of when John Galliano was at the you know, height of his career and it's all the supermodels. And so there was a real sense of nostalgia and um, it was a very, very intimate personal archive as well as the sort of archive of him uh you know doing his racist tirade which was um, obviously really shocking at the time and still is um so it, it just transports you you know and I think that's what is um but it transports you but you see it you see it in a completely different way um so yeah it was it was very good thanks Fals. yeah that's great D Donna what about you uh I would go for Beckham on Netflix uh because it was an amazing romp and uh, exactly what you want from that type of series, you know, it promised heavy on unseen footage and quite often uh, those promises aren't fulfilled, but I think this one did. Um, you know, for a story that we think we know really, really, really well, um, all the um, all the info and data and footage we've seen of, of the Beckhams across the years, but I think it did give us new insight. And I think it did the big picture stuff really well, those big sporting moments that we kind of all thought we knew the detail of, did the really big picture and the really intimate stuff really well. So for me, it was those 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 elements that kind of really made it sing for me. Thanks, Donna. And lastly, our archive producer, Sam, what about you? It, it's um, a I, bit like a busman's holiday asking you this question. <laughs> I can't give you one because, of course, I'm obsessed with archives. So I ra I'll rattle off a couple. Um, I love the Wham film just because uh, it was a job I really, really wish I had worked on. I love George Michael and just thought the whole film was truly joyful. I absolutely loved it and had a smile on my face from start to finish. Um, I loved Big Oil versus the World, um, which was on the BBC. I think I thought it was an incredible uh, archive job because it really it, it's the kind of film that it can be quite difficult to work on because it had a really strong editorial and investigative line running through it. And the pressure was really on somebody to try and find archive that that demonstrates that and illustrates the points that the the film is trying to make and it did that brilliantly and it's shocking and it's something that everybody should watch um i loved moon age daydream because 
it's a cinematic archive film and very often when you're dealing with music archive uh, from particular eras sometimes the quality can be pretty poor and this film clearly was done with a lot of time and love and the restoration of the film was fantastic i watched it in an imax cinema and it was so immersive it was absolutely wonderful i was in tears at the end of it and just thought it was incredible um and but i think my favorite it, it's not that new but it's a couple of years old now but it was a netflix series um the warhol diaries because it was all archive and it demonstrated a life that was lived on camera or so it felt everything about the man's life um was filmed or photographed uh, often knowingly um and and yet it portrayed a very intimate version of somebody's life um using ar in a you know using a voiceover in a very uh, unusual at the time way um you know so uh I thought that was just luxurious and gorgeous and just fantastic to watch. Thanks, Sam. Um, thank you very much. Um, so quickly moving on, I want to ask uh, Donna and uh, Fozia questions about the scheme, really. So um, just taking a few at a time. Um, who is the scheme targeted at? And that's for Donna. And then uh, for Fozia, why has Amazon partnered up with the Grierson Trust uh, to create this scheme? Why is it necessary? So Donna, do you want to go first? Yeah, brilliant. And it was great to see um, in, in that survey, in the Menti survey, the types of jobs you're doing now and what some of those barriers might be. Um, Prime Video Pathway is a three-year uh, initiative from Amazon, 10 million spent on training in total to help diversify the industry, bring new entrants in, but to really, really support freelancers who are already in the industry. We don't need to tell um, you how tough it is at the moment. I could see from that graph just how many of you aren't working at the moment or haven't worked for a while so we don't need to tell you how tough it is so part of what we want to do at amazon is really really support um freelancers either upskill or reskill so who it's aimed at it's it's people already in the industry this is not for brand new new entrants this is for people already in the industry about two or three years experience you can be from the editorial side researcher, AP producer, you can be from the production management side, PC, PM, PA, um, both sides this will work for. We think it will really work if you are looking for a part-time opportunity. I could see um, some of the people on here today are returners to work. We'd really, really love if this would work for some returners to work to bridge you uh, back into work and for carers, people who have caring um, responsibilities. So it's for people who are absolutely passionate about unscripted i can't stress that enough this is unscripted this is documentary and those of you who are really passionate about archive really telling those stories so that's really who it's aimed at people with two three years experience in the industry working in unscripted consuming hours and hours and hours of unscripted each week loving those documentaries people who are really curious people who are organized people who are creative problem solvers, people who are good in a team, but good working on their own. Um, people who've already got great skills, but want to add to their skills mix and reskill and upskill. So that's, that's what I would say is kind of the key people we're looking for, two to three years um, experience uh, at that level to, to show to us that you really love unscripted and documentary and have got some some knack or love or curiosity um, about the archive element of it as well. Thanks, Donna. And Fozia, uh, about the skills gap, you know, why, why is the scheme necessary? So um, basically, documentaries and premium factual is quite new for us in, uh, um, in UK originals. Um, and so I should really say that what what's what what we do, what we're trying to do is um, uh, make really, really high quality docs and doc series and and feature docs. Um, but we are we're, we're still in our infancy, but we're we're hoping to grow um, that genre. And I think the big thing about um, having a documentary and a streamer, we're quite limited in lots of ways. So when I was a commissioner at Channel Four, I worked on things like police custody 
um, BBC, obviously the things like Ambulance, these observate like big, big observational documentary series. We can't do things like that. So we are quite um, limited and actually in lots of ways because we are a global streamer and we need everything to stay up on our on our service in perpetuity so we have lots of legal considerations so that means that a lot of things that you know the bbc and channel 4 um make we could we couldn't make so a lot of our stories are retrospective um not everything but we do do a lot of that that kind of documentary so when i started um uh, commissioning documentaries so it was it was really obvious that there was a, a shortage in in archive producers. it was always a thing that production companies would say to me is um you know we, we were waiting for this archive producer and I just felt like we're trying to make more of these types of um documentaries so this is a really really brilliant um thing to do um and also like some of my favorite documentaries are very archive based um you know, like I'm thinking about one day in September or, you know, once upon a time in Iraq, like they're so brilliant and gripping. Um, the other the other thing about making, uh, you know, not being able to make observational documentaries or have unfolding um, uh, actuality is that, you know, you're quite limited in that, you know, you can only really use drama recon or archive to tell the story, you know, with interviews. Um, and so often when we are being pitched ideas, and we're saying, what's new about this? When someone has discovered a new piece of archive or you know, they're, they're basically going to use archive in a, in a very different way to tell a story, that's really, really exciting for us. And often we'll put things into development because of that very reason that you know, someone has is is wants to tell a story, maybe you think you know it, but suddenly there's a new bit of archive or the way they're gonna use the archive is completely new. And that is really, really exciting. Um, so again, you know, I think that, um, you know this is an area that we're just we're just keen to grow and, and, and keen to utilize these skills in what we make sorry i was rambling on there i hope that, I hope that all made sense <laughs> thanks fuzzy i think we've actually lost yen for the moment i don't know if you're able to move on to the the sort of next um point on the sheet i'm just um working on getting her back in the room I think it's me. I think it's me. Um, okay, so I think um, I'll explain a little bit about what you can exp expect to learn on the course. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, it's a sort of a start to finish of the archive world. Um, it will be a sort of an example of a typical schedule from start to finish um, from actually pre-production it will be sort of development stage um and um all of the sort of issues that i really want to deal with will range from the practical side in terms of research and um looking in detail at the kind of libraries that and, and collections that exist um the kind of material that they that they have how they work um, there'll be a logistical side to things, so um, such as you know how to download and label clips, um, how to work with an edit, who in a production does what, what the key relationships will be within a production. Um, there'll be a technical side because um, depending on the project, um, the technical side can become really quite complicated. Uh, there'll be a legal side because um, you'll be clearing for certain uh, set of rights depending on what the production is um, and an archive producer is usually expected to clear the material within budget and on schedule so um, you know that can be quite tough um, and there'll be sort of a very personal side to it too which is to do with managing relationships managing expectations working remotely, um, managing time, how to prioritise work. Um, I'm sure that they're the kind of things that an existing skill set will be strong on, but it's it's more and more in archive, uh, you know, you can have a role that is a cross between a therapist and a lawyer and a line producer, you know, as well as the archive researcher, all rolled into one. There is a very strong kind of 
personal side to what you're kind of expected to do and you have to it's a delicate balancing act and um I just know that the the way I work I, I'd be able to share some of the methods of sort of helping that whole situation because the current lands uh, archive landscape is is changing quite a lot um for several reasons I think lockdown changed the way the archive is researched and delivered it changed schedules it changed the way that edits and post-production work um the domination of the streamers has really put a different slant on things um and AI in the current form um in the different types of AI is at a point where we're at a real cross in the roads and things could go lots of different ways because the law on AI in the UK has not been um, decided yet. Um, there are lots of legal cases involving people like Getty Images and um, so everyone's kind of waiting to see what happens with AI and it's a really hot topic in the world of archive. So um, there's a lot to take on board, you know, there's lots of different threads to do with archive and it's not just sitting on YouTube all day finding a clip. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. So apologies, everybody. I got kicked out of the room, so I'm, I'm, I missed um, bits and bits and pieces. But Sam, um, did you get a chance or did you touch on the other things um, outside of the online week? Should I just cover those quickly? Please do that, Yen, please. Yeah. So, um, as I said right at the beginning, for those of you who weren't there um, 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 when we started, Grist and Trust in Terms of Doc Lab, we have a long standing track record, and I'd like to think established and successful in what we do in terms of formula to support people in industry um, to get that first foot in the door. And over the last three years, with people who are established and either career changes or people are seeking opportunities to step up. So um, once, if you if you are selected for the scheme, um, you have ongoing bespoke support from us. Um, we do networking events, as I mentioned before. We have the Grierson Awards, where you'll be meeting industry professionals of probably about six or seven hundred people. Um, as part of this scheme specifically, there will be a residential in the Peak District, where we'll be getting a chance to meet each other. Because although the scheme is online, it's very important for us to gel and get to know each other. And the beauty of the scheme is that there's only eight of you. You get the chance to know us. We get a chance to know you my role together with Tanya the coordinators to support you and help you um you know make contacts make introductions introduce your talent managers whatever it is because it's a small team we can we can do that with you you'll have an industry mentor as well and that'll be discussed and um we'll be doing also some site visits to places that you might not have had opportunities to go to before. So we'll be looking at some archives. So that might be some big ones or some smaller intimate ones. I'm certainly go and do a session um, at a post-production house talking to those who, you know, um, and often the crunch point is when you're in post. And, you know, archive is one of those budget lines that often gets squeezed quite a lot. Want to make life easier for everybody. So knowing how, how it works in post and what the workflow is and um, um, understanding that and demystifying that will be um, helpful to everybody. So those are the sorts of things that we will be doing in addition to the online intensive week. And then I make no apologies. You know, we we do work people really hard, but the um, the payoff is, is that you have this great grounding and it's about them preparing you for the real world in terms of those placements that we will be negotiating and brokering through the support of Netflix, but also, sorry, Net Amazon, and then um, also other um, broadcasters and uh, streamers as well, because um, the productions that you would be placed on won't necessarily just be Amazon um, productions. Um, that would be worth mentioning. Uh, Donna, is it else, Fozzie, anything else to add to that? No, I think we've covered it all. I think the only other thing to say is we, you know, we really are keen that we we have um, applicants and delegates across section across the UK so please don't think this is just London or just the South East we really do want to support freelancers and support our production companies and our indies making great content for us um, all across the UK so just yeah. really welcome those. Um, yeah, so cost should not should not be seen as a barrier for, um, and people thinking that they can't afford to participate. There is no cost to you if you are successful. We pay for your transport to the um, residential. If you're uh, coming down to the Grierson Awards in London, we will co cover all those costs because um, we understand that, you know, not everybody has um, friends and family that they can stay with in London when they're um, going to be doing the on-site visits or whether we're doing any any networking. We do have a budget to look after that as well. With that then, um, we've finished the formal 
part of the of the of the call and it's now an opportunity for people to share questions with us and um, ask for any clarity of things that they want um, want to ask or unsure of. Um, we've got one question already and actually Hannah because I was kicked out um, I now can't see the chat previously so um, if you oh great thank you so um Question from Georgia asking about FOSIA. Um, are you looking for people to pitch ideas at a directorial level as well as a practical side of archive production and research? Not looking for people to pitch ideas uh, in this scheme. Um, no. Yeah, thank you. And then um, I think this was for Donna and Sam, really. It's about the placements and about where they're going to be shot full time, you know, whether they can be part time, how they're going to be run. Um, Donna, do you want to do you want to take that question? Take that. Yeah. Um, just as kind of Yen said at the beginning, this is a pilot scheme, so we're all learning as we go along. So we haven't set up any of the placements yet. Um, we're starting to talk to our trusted production uh companies and our indies. And it may be that you work on Amazon content, but it could be that you work on somebody else's content. So you won't just be working on Amazon productions. So we are starting to have those conversations with production companies to see what's in production at the time when these placements start, where they can really offer some really, really solid training sitting alongside uh, an experienced um, archive producer. Um, so at the moment, we don't know where they are or who they're with, but we know we're talking to people who are really, really interested to have um, these delegates on board. So can't say when and where they are. We also want to make them fit around you. So we want to, we've got to make both sides of the jigsaw work. We've got to talk to our production companies who've got great, interesting work and enough work to share um, with one of our trainees, but also we want to make it work around uh, where you live, your timings and your lifestyle as well. So what we'll do is when we've selected our eight, we'll look at what your interests are, where you are, and try and match you with the best production and the best production company. But we haven't got those set up yet. We're waiting to see who comes on board, starting to have those conversations with Indies about what work is likely to be around in that period. Yeah, and also the timing will vary. You know, they're not all going to start at, um, say, at the end of the scheme. As Donna says, um, we don't know what's, what's in the pipeline. We don't know who we're going to be working with. And therefore, it's really hard to predict when some of these placements will be. But what we want to do is make sure that they're, they're fitting around you, they're bespoke. It's an organic process. And um, as I always say with the other schemes where I have to manage placements, it's like a moving jigsaw. It's not quite simple to say it's going to happen at X. As we know, when we're working on a production, things can go belly up and therefore things can't go according to plan. So there has to be some flexibility and understanding um, um, around that. Thank you. Um, question about, oops, sorry, then moving around there. So next question is, um, are the placements paid? Fozia, do you want to answer that? Yes, I believe they are, aren't they, Donna? Yes, most most definitely. Yeah, they really, they definitely are paid for the full 10 weeks. But also, if somebody, if, if there is a need for someone to work part time, and if that works for the production company and the experienced archive producer, they're, they're based with and partnered with, if you're only going to work two or three days a week, we, we might be able to increase the 10 weeks so overall you're getting 10 weeks experience and 10 weeks paid but absolutely they they are those 10 weeks are paid placements yeah and worth saying is that if anybody needs um uh, reasonable adjustments just because of the, uh, the backgrounds if they have any barriers that's something that we will pick up with uh, individuals as well because we want to make sure this is as fully inclusive as possible um so those are conversations and things that we will look for um to for you if you feel um, comfortable sharing that with us um, in your application as well. Um, I have a question uh, from somebody. Can I apply if I have several years of experience um, if I'm a recent returner? Donna, do you want to answer that? So I suspect this person may have may have accumulated more than just two to three years and that and now they're returning to industry. Yeah, I think look, we've given the two to three years as a guide. There isn't an upper limit. As we've said, we really, really, really want this to work uh, for a range of people, particularly returners to work. So if you have had a pause and a gap from the industry, then yes, we would look favourably on that. So I wouldn't see that as a barrier if you've had more years experience, as long as you meet all the other criteria. 
Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, question about CVs. Um, I'll answer this. So somebody's asking, would a, a two page be preferred or industry standard of one page? Um, I'm quite happy given that there's people in the room who have who aren't new entrants and therefore it'd be quite um, reasonable to expect two pages from you. But obviously, if you can fit it on one page, uh, do. But if you um, the way that you formatted it, it's on two pages, that's fine. Um, so I'm not going to be as long as it's not reams and reams. That's 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 OK. Um, question about somebody from Germany. I think um, in our guidelines, we are quite clear. Um, there's no you have to have um, uh, right to work in the UK. So UK residents, this is a scheme to support people who are living here. If you have the right to work here, that is fine. But um, it is for people who are based in the UK. Um, Time frame. I think we've uh, we've covered that. And basically, it is about um, a bespoke system. Once people have been selected through the scheme, then we will start conversations. And then on the other side, it's about knowing who um, has work in the pipeline that can take on this, um, a play a trainee who's interested in supporting us as well. Um, Will a candidate be considered if uh, under a year experience? Um, sorry, no, we've um, we've explained that. It is looking for people who have who are not new entrants. We're looking for people uh, two to three years. And then um, somebody, a question for Sam, I think. Um, following from what Sam's, oh gosh, moving that. Following from what Sam said about archive changing after lockdown, I'm curious to know in what way the landscape has changed. I've only worked as an archive researcher pre-lockdown, so uh, interested um, what you mean by that. So, Sam, can you just give mm. a, just a quick overview, a few pointers for uh, for this person? I think what happened with lockdown is two things happened at the same time. Um, people in lockdown had to work remotely. So I was working on multiple projects from start to finish where I never met one single person on the production until it had finished which is very strange um, and not ideal. But now that lockdown has finished, that method of working has not gone back to how it used to be. So you can quite often be working on a production where the direct, you know, people within the production team can be in six or seven different places around the world. Um, it's not always a, a physical place where the edit's taking place in terms of a a, a, a post-production facility or an edit facility. It can be somebody's bedroom. You know, it can be made from the editor's shed still. Um, the other thing that happened in lockdown is that because uh, the output with the streamers just went through the roof and exploded, um, the kind of rights that the streamers usually want uh, are all encompassing. They usually, for docs, they usually want all media worldwide, including theatrical or limited theatrical in perpetuity. What hasn't changed is that the budgets have not always gone up in parallel with that. So that means that previously a documentary might have been cleared for television worldwide for 10 years. Suddenly, uh, you're trying to make the figures match for all media for 30 years or in perpetuity. So it, it's tough um, trying to make those budgets work. Um, the other thing that seems to be happening, and I naively thought that this was a bit of a, a, a sort of a one-off, and now I'm realizing it's normality, it's a trend, in that there used to be a schedule that would be given to you where there would be a lock date and then it'd be several weeks. Uh, a buffer zone between locking and post-production starting. That doesn't happen anymore. Edits just carry on editing right up until the grade. And that's making work for archive producers really, really, really tough because you can't be costing and sourcing archive for a cut that is constantly changing. The risk is that you end up ordering in master material uh, that might be cut out and wasted, you're wasting money. Um, so you're kind of spinning a lot of plates in post-production. And sadly for me, I, it's just, I'm, you know, it just seems to be the norm now and it's making things really, really hard. So I guess they're the three main things. There are, there are other things too, but that they're the main things that have changed the way I have to work. That's great. Thanks, Sam. Um, got a question about um, working patterns. So uh, probably one for you again, Sam. 
the reality, our archive producers are working part time. They, and this person, I think it's Molly, was saying that in the job adverts that I've seen, most are short contracts or full time. Uh, I, I think it's a mixture of both. Um, it, it depends on so many things, like the, the sort of the level of archive content there is, um, the schedule, whether it's sort of short and compact and intense or long and thin and skinny. You know, it, if it's long and thin, they tend to want somebody who can spread their time over a longer period, which usually means part time. Um, but it depends on so many things. If it's if it's a team of people working on an all archive project, that could it could be full time. It could be a project that doesn't have a great deal of archive. But if you're freelance, you could be working on a couple of part time projects at the same time. But you, if you're working in house at a production company, you could be working on a couple of projects in house at the same time. So even if a job is part time, you may not be working part time. It, it, but it's a case by case basis. Every job is really different. OK, thanks, Sam. Um, this is a question from somebody asking about whether they're eligible or not. So they were uh, working as um, working industry for six years, um, finishing off as an AP and then have gone off to do a graduate degree uh, relating to archive. Are they eligible uh, to apply? Donna, what's your thinking about how, uh, thinking uh, about that? What do you think? Yeah, again, I think it comes back to we're staying flexible. This person um, has had a break and clearly done um, a grad degree in something that's kind of really, really interesting and fascinating. So I would say yes, um, uh, kind of give it a go. But um, as you can see, there are lots and lots and lots of people on this call already up to 100. So this will be really competitive, really over prescribed. So if somebody meets the criteria, in a much tighter way than you, you're, you're, you could have a struggle. But I think the fact that you've got that degree and you've been out of the industry is, is interesting. So I would say yes. Yeah, there's uh, nothing to lose basically. Uh, I think it's a really good ex experience to um, to apply. to apply. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, rates, what what is the current going rate for a new, for an archive producer? So I don't know, is that a Fozier question as well as a Sam question? Sam, I honestly, it's, it's probably Sam, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't know, actually. Um, there are certain pe certainly people that could tell you. There's Beck2 that has a rate card. There is Focal, which is an organisation that represents archive film researchers and producers. Um, I know a few years, there's also a Facebook group for certain archive producers. But I think you need a certain number of credits to be on that Facebook group. I, I'm not on it, but... I think rates are discussed on there. I think it can be anything from, I know a few years ago, it used to range from a eight, 180 pounds a day upwards, but I think I think rates have gone up since then. I know an American archive producer that gets $3,500 a week, which is $700. I mean, that's like, you know, so it depends on the project, depends on experience, it depends on the budget, it, you know, it's really up to negotiation. Sorry, that's a bit vague. <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks, Sam. Um, Chris is asking about the experience. Um, I think what we're looking for, as long as um, it doesn't really matter whether you um, you could be coming from editorial, you could be coming from production management. If you're working production management, you're working on lots of different projects. It's about demonstrating the passion and actually those transferable skills. So I wouldn't say um, it specifically has to be archive, um, AJ, um, specifically archive what you need to do is actually demonstrate to us why it is that you want to um, be working and you know aiming for that role basically um can the three can the years of experience be within scripted production um that would be a more harder one to to justify donna what's your thinking um i i would say no um just because we really really want people that are committed to unscripted and people who have that experience and that love and there, so I'm sorry, but um, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of training programs in scripted, and this one is exclusively for uh, unscripted. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and honest. it's going to be very competitive. So even if you did apply and you can make a good argument, there'll be lots of people ahead of you who have that experience who can demonstrate that they've actually got a track record. So as Donna says, uh, look at um, screen skills. Certainly they have lots of different um, uh, training programs that you could be looking at. But I'm um, sorry, on this occasion, uh, it won't be applicable for you. Um, just running through some of these uh, inscriptive. Uh, Non-broadcast, can you accept applicants background for non-broadcast? researcher no i don't think that similarly to the scripted one really we're looking for people who've got that track record already to build on and um, because then they've had a taste of what they want to do and can actually build on that because what we're trying to do is break down those barriers to stop people who are preventing people from stepping up basically so um <laughs> oh dear All right so i think i think uh matty a, a very nice offer but we'll we'll pass on that one thank you very much um <laughs> Okay, again, uh, somebody is asking about, would you consider an applicant with seven years plus experience working podcasting and radio, predominantly making factual content, experience with working in archive material? Again, I'll have to pick that up. I think it, you know, very happy to take your application, but there, there will probably be stronger applicants who do have that TV documentary experience, but also, we're really happy to kind of take people and cross them from radio, you know, kind of huge, huge transferable skills. So I would say go for it, but there are probably people who are going to be stronger in the mix. There's a question, Yen, right at the end about age. Is there an upper limit? Yes, absolutely, yes. absolutely not. Uh, no, age is not a barrier at all. No, definitely. OK, um, I think we'll make this the last question. Yes. And then what we'll do is just return back to the mentee and just for some final comments. Um, this last one's from Kiana. Um, would applicants with experience of working on only one film that used archive be considered, or is it necessary to have worked on two or three or more? We haven't stated that you have to work on a number of productions. Um, so if you meet the criteria that if you've been working on that film for two to three years, um, if, if that meets the criteria. Um, I think, again, you're going to be a stronger con candidate if you've got a mix and a range of productions on your CV. There's no question that if you've only worked on one production, uh, you know, one way of working and one production team, et cetera. So if you've got more experience and a range of programmes, you're going to be a much stronger candidate. OK, that's great. Thank you very much, panel. Um, I'm just going to return back to the mentee for two more Two more um, follow-up questions and then we'll be wrapping up. So if people can go back to, I'm just gonna share my screen, she says, go back to the screen, sharing it. So we've just got two questions. I think it's just two anyway, she says. Uh, can people see that? Yes. Right. After this session, how confident do you feel about applying? So for those of you who have said that you've still got some questions, please don't hesitate in getting in touch with us. Uh, our email is training at grierson.trust.org. Let me just wait a few more moments for any more, any more people replying. Okay, I think we're stuck at 50, slightly up. Okay. This is as much an opportunity for you as, an, as a person that's jumped onto this call to reflect. Um, this is obviously useful for us, but also it is about um, asking yourself, is this the right scheme for you? So this is quite an important question. But great that we have so many of you who think that this is, this is the right thing for you to be following up. So thank you. And then just my last question, really, are there any other comments that, or do you have any anything else that you want to share with us? So this will be our last, last slide.
some very good um, comments. And what we'll do is um, have a chance to go through this um, uh, ourselves and we'll, we'll be able to answer, answer these. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen because I'm just conscious about time. Yen, I'm just yeah. wondering if we, if we can take some of these common themes and, and um, add them to an FAQ so they go yes. on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've got the FAQ. That's a growing document. So that's what we will do. Yeah. Um, and I suppose now an, an opportunity for Sam, Fozia and Donna, just any last comments as we wrap up uh, with a few minutes to go before we hit our deadline. Um, Sam, do you want to, any last comments that you want to offer? Um, there were just one of the questions that popped up there was, what are the main attributes of a good archive producer? And what I would say is, uh, to that is there are, there are lots of things that you need to bear in mind, but more than anything, as well as as well as an absolute obsession with archive, um, it's and a knowledge of how to do the job. It's also it's also a temperamental thing, having the right temperament to be able to work on a production. And I think if you've been within a live production for a couple of years, you'll know what I mean. You know, it, it takes a little while to realise that if a director is changing their mind all the time, um, that actually shouldn't be annoying. That's part of the process. And and learning that can sometimes take a while, actually. And if you if you're the kind of person that gets annoyed about being messed around or if you see it as being messed around all the time, maybe that's it's not the right job for you because you have to be quite quick footed and nimble to and flexible to be able to sort of you know adjust and present a solution to what are going to be endless endless problems no it's magic isn't it you're trying to create for them and uh, answer help that director realize their creative vision on the screen if they're changing all the time that is a difficult one to do uh Fozia, any last and um, last comments from you um just it just sounds like a brilliant scheme like I, I you know donna and i talk about this a lot you know come coming up the industry um, when we did the well especially i don't know you at the bbc donna so there was some training but for me there was no training in anything you learned everything on the job and made 100 mistakes and i think it's brilliant to, to be able to learn from such brilliant professionals and a big aim of this of our prime video pathways to professionalize our industry and give people the skills they need so please do use this opportunity um if you think it's right for you thank you and donna uh, no, i just wanted to say it's great to be uh working with grison and you can tell from sam her absolute knowledge across the industry and her passion for running this scheme and working and helping others so thanks for your engagement thanks for your great questions i think at the moment as fozia said there genuinely is a shortage at the moment so if we can match brilliant people upskill them professionalize them and move them into that it is something you can teach as sam has covered or everything from rights legal to the personal attributes and we will only place you with very 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 brilliant lovely fantastic caring indies on great projects we will look after you if you come on this program with us Thank you very much. I'm very, you know, I've been doing this role for many years um, and it's brilliant that we've got this opportunity to do something and make a difference and shift the dial on this area. Um, Sam and I met up um, before Christmas and talking about potential case studies and we've got some really fantastic people, um, if we can pin them down, to come and talk to the successful eight. So it's going to be a fantastic programme. Please do apply. You have nothing to lose. Any questions, please do get in touch with us. Um, this will be available online over the next few days. Um, so if you want to uh, revisit anything, please do. Um, but otherwise, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Bye.